Climb into the cockpit with pilot and Wing Square's Chief Legal Officer, Tim Perilla, as he invites legal leaders aboard to share advice that will help you navigate even the most turbulent times of in-house counsel work. We'll cover a range of topics from data privacy to legal team structure to public company transactions and beyond. You don't want to miss this series. Fasten your seatbelt and prepare for takeoff. You're listening to Cockpit Council. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we've got another episode of Cockpit Council today. Really excited. We've got uh, Eliana Lee. Eliana is uh, one of one of our outstanding AI and legal minds here at Link Squares. Um, Eliana, welcome. Uh, first, we start off every single show with uh, asking what the pre-flight ritual is. So. Do you have a pre-flight ritual? And if so, what is it? Actually, we're more of a road trip family. So what we do is we make this massive list and we check everything off because <laughs> we're always going to leave something at home. But what one thing I say in my family is, do you have your phone and your charger? That, right. that is the big thing because someone's always going to leave without one of those two <laughs> things. That's that's absolutely fair. That's actually usually, uh, that's definitely on my list too. Like. Phone, charger, wallet, keys. Mm -hmm. All right, good go. <laughs> Definitely. So, um, so before we get into it, you also brought our little Link Squares mascot here. Uh, absolutely incredible. Um, give us a background on it. So this is Linky. Um, I actually collect plush robots. It's something I started doing when I started my data science graduate program because it reminds me that our, we have to be very mindful when we develop AI and I, I think make them fuzzy, you know, make sure you remember there's people behind them and data yeah. and especially with legal data, we have to be protective. So, so I had Linky made when I started being the legal tech and AI champion here as part of my role and he's kind of the mascot unofficially. That's awesome. It's so cool. I think it actually Linky has officially become the mascot now. <laughs> they, I, we have no other choice, right? Yeah, I think people would love wearing merch, so. Exactly. exactly. Having their own one. <laughs> so um, you've had a really interesting career. Um, walk, uh, walk me through it. Tell me, tell me how you got to where you are today and um, uh, you know, everything from what sort of brought you into law school and how you, how you just progressed as a pro through, throughout that. Sure. Well, I went to a small women's college. We did not have the, the program did not have computer science or anything technical. So I did information management with a concentration in computing, but I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. So I did some career testing when I was a junior and it said I had a strength in law, which was yeah. hilarious to me because <laughs> I'm kind of a very shy and reserved person. And the thought of litigating was nightmarish. Sure. But I did more research and I found out about law librarianship and I thought, oh, wow, that really fits. But then I learned I needed to get a JD, a Juris Doctorate, as well as a graduate degree in library and information science. So I'm one of the few people who went to law school not to become a traditional lawyer. Right. I wanted to become a law librarian. So I, I attended part time law school in the evening and I did an online graduate program in library and information science. And I, I did that remotely. So it took me longer, but I finished. Right. But I, I'm, I've always been a futurist, really interested in technology and the future. And so originally I had planned to be a law librarian in either a firm or academia, but I married someone that was an energy attorney. Okay. And we lived <laughs> all over the US. We lived in North Dakota, Eastern Ohio and Wyoming and just never lived anywhere long enough or large enough to work in those areas. So I ended up becoming a research attorney in the energy industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. But as I was working, I was noticing things, big changes that were starting in law. It really started with e-discovery and I saw that com computing was used more and they were starting to kind of make predictions. And I thought, oh, wow, this is so exciting. Yeah. And I wanted to be part of that change but then I realized I didn't have the knowledge that was needed for a role like that. So I did my own research and I found data science. And I thought, amazing, it's, it'll be just like information science. No, <laughs> not <laughs> so at all. Mildly different, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. So I started a graduate program in data science online and it was so overwhelming because it's a mixture of 
kind of computer science, heavy on statistics, linear algebra, just yeah. things most attorneys don't get excited about. Right, right. And, and so, yes, I, I, I started that and there was so much talk about numbers and I remember feeling, oh no, where does law fit? Right. I have no idea and going through the courses. And so when I got to the machine learning course, towards the end, we, we finally talked about legal te or text. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had an aha moment when I learned about NLP, natural language processing. Yeah. And I thought, oh, wow, this is where we can where law fits. Law is all about words. And this right. was kind of text analysis, predictions on words. And so I knew when I finished this graduate program, I needed to find a company that used NLP because I was so excited about it. I, my final project, my capstone, I used NLP mm -hmm. and I just was so excited. But then of course the pandemic hit and I just had such a hard time finding a job, even just interviewing with all the different legal tech companies. It was tricky, but it was suggested to me that I should start posting on LinkedIn because yeah. I had kind of an unusual knowledge that a lot of people didn't have. I would say so. Yeah. And uh, how, how many of your classmates uh, in the graduate programs had JDs? Zero, just me. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I was, I was kind of the anomaly, the outlier. And I think it was amusing to the other people who were yeah. very numbers driven. Yeah. What was, what was your mathematical background beforehand? Did you, did you have any, <laughs> any sort of strong undergraduate math, uh, math background or stats background? just what was required for my major. But so this, <laughs> this was a giant leap into multivariate statistics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's incredible. I mean, and uh, absolutely courageous leap too. It's, uh, I've worked a lot with uh, a lot with folks who have a lot of the analytics backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, particularly at DraftKings worked, uh, worked a ton with them, whether it was, um, you know, on the product, sort of the product development side, or even to a certain extent, some of the controversies uh, that that we went through as an organization. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, just uh, seeing the depth of understanding that people who really are trained in this can bring to the table is is really enlightening, and something that I think um, you know is is actually kind of ex or should be kind of inspiring for a lot of lawyers to go and learn more about this because. As as data becomes more and more prevalent throughout our society, mm -hmm. there are going to be more and more legal issues associated with it. Definitely. And so, being able to at least be conversant and like understand what you don't quite understand yet, I think, is really important for any lawyers who are practicing in mm -hmm. in this area. Um, so, brought you to Link Squares then, right? Writing articles on LinkedIn, we end up uh, end up end up recruiting you in. Tell us a little bit more about your role here. Yeah, so I was very fortunate. Um, my LinkedIn content was noticed by one of someone who's now a manager in sales, and I was connected to my current boss that way, okay. the director of legal engineering, who's a woman. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, what I do, I do so many things. So legal engineering is unique because we basically work with all the different departments in different ways. Mm -hmm. So one thing, one of the main things I do is develop legal AI models, which we know as smart values, mm -hmm. and we're kind of half of the process. So data science is the other half. We have right. absolute superstars in data science. Yep. They're just amazing. What a team. They are. Yeah. Just working with them and collaborating them is, is a dream. It's wonderful. So yeah. legal engineering kind of does the research, looks at what the trends are. We also look at what sales prospects are asking and customer success and just kind of what's happening in law and what's exciting. And so we develop smart values based on that. And there's kind of a file analysis process where we look at all different types of legal language because you want the most variation as possible for the most accurate right. smart value or legal AI model. And then once once we have that all written out for annotation, data science takes over and does their magic okay. <laughs> and engineers the smart value. We also have machine learning engineers that are involved. And so, so that's kind of that process. Another thing we do is when people have questions about smart values, often it comes through customer success. Yep. And so if something isn't working how it's expected or just questions about anything having to do with smart values, 
we handle those. Yeah. And we also educate, well, we, we educate internally mm -hmm. with different departments. We do presentations, we write content, trap questions for sales. And we also write blog articles and, and we do LinkedIn content. I do the Legal Tech and AI champion work. And we're now also, I think, going to be going on TikTok and okay. Instagram Reels doing some right. educating videos, but also some more fun ones. <laughs> Linky will be definitely featured in those. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we develop custom smart values too for yeah. customers. So custom AI, sometimes our global models just do not pick up exactly what the customer wants, the interpretation's different, mm -hmm. or they have just such a unique ask that we just need to develop something custom. Right. So AI is thrown around a lot mm -hmm. these days, and some of some of this is actual, you know, artificial intelligence, others is actual individuals, and there's some that's kind of in between that. What is AI to you? And um, when you think about some of the you know some of the different sort of whether they're whether they're fears or whatever it may be um you know how would you comfort someone who's just not familiar with ai how would you explain to someone who's not familiar with with ai what the goals are what ai means to you how you think about it from from the perspective of your role here so it's best to define ai um, especially legal ai it's AI, artificial intelligence, is a really broad term. It involves different subcategories, such as deep learning and neural networks. But most commonly, AI in legal tech and AI is connected to machine learning. And machine learning is the idea of predictions that are made on large data sets. And these predictions find hidden patterns in these data sets that a human cannot understand or comprehend, it just okay. isn't possible. Right. And so those predictions are made. There's two different types of machine learning. There's supervised and unsupervised. Okay. Unsupervised machine learning is, one legal example would be just case text, no labels, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Or if something's scraped from the web, that's usually, it's considered unstructured data. Yeah. Okay. And then supervised machine learning really simply is structured data. It's okay. it's labeled. So okay. so those are kind of two differences. And um, if someone's afraid of legal AI, I, I guess one way to explain it is, I, I like to explain it as training a puppy. So okay. with legal AI models, you have to train the machine learning algorithm when there's language that it's not familiar with. Okay. And so I always tell people when you get a puppy, they're pretty amazing, right? Yeah. But sometimes they need to be redirected a little bit if they behave in a different way. Right. So when we need to retrain the AI model, it's like retraining a puppy, you know, just making it more accurate, more efficient, just functioning better. And with legal language, you need to retrain your legal AI models, which are smart values all the time because there's always new ways that people are drafting different provisions and also newer concepts in law, things change. So. Right. So as far as, um, as far as like combating AI drift, is that where these corrections sort of come into play? Yes, because what's really important in legal AI models is accuracy. But the thing is accuracy can really fluctuate and change. It's not a static thing. Right. So what you're trying to do is make your legal AI model, the smart value, the most accurate as possible right. because AI is never perfect, but it is pretty amazing. <laughs> so from a, from a legal tech industry, where do you see AI, um, let's just call it five years, 10 years down the line, how how are you, how are you thinking that people are going to be using AI in sort of everyday everyday uh, whether it's private practice whether it's in house practice what uh, what are your thoughts on it? I, I think there's some pretty exciting things happening with litigation. There's judicial analytics, hmm. so they're using AI to determine 
well, how a judge might rule. Oh, based, and, on, and based on the prior cases. That's based on, yeah, previous cases yeah. because there's patterns, right? Yeah. And also who opposing counsel is and what their record is. And yeah. it's just amazing. And they can determine, do we settle or do we not based on this information? And it's also yeah. saving clients money. So that's kind of just beginning and it's exciting. Yeah. And I think attorneys AI is going to just be part of legal practice. And I think there's going to be more of what we call personalization so there'll be layers where an attorney can input information to make the algorithms function more in a custom manner. Okay, that's that's awesome. And so, from from your perspective, how do you see um, how do you see sort of the interface? So, if I'm you know if I'm an attorney without any background and don't really understand how you know if I do want to put something custom in, mm -hmm. what what does that look like? Does that is that something that, you know, maybe there's someone with a background like what you have um, having a conversation saying, OK, I get what you're trying to do and, and going and influencing the AI in that way? Or do you think this is going to be more of a self-serve sort of thing? Or how are, how are you thinking about that? In the future? Yeah. I think it's going to be both. OK. Because I, I think you're always going to have these massive global models that work for most contract provisions. But obviously, you're going to have situations where perhaps it's the party name that doesn't come through how the customer wants or right. just sticky, thorny things that change AI models. So legal AI, all AI has trouble. Obviously, a machine can't think. Everyone thinks it can, and they call it machine learning, but I think it should be called machine training because okay. it, the system can't reason. And, and a big thing with law that's lacking in AI is context. You know, right. context is so important in legal language and legal yeah. argument. And so AI doesn't have that. So you're always going to need a human attorney to interpret any output from the legal AI model that's, or smart value, yeah. and also to visualize that information in a meaningful way. And I think dashboards are going to become more and more intelligent and customized. And all of, obviously reporting is super important because different corporate legal departments can really gain amazing actionable insight into their legal data. And it's really not done before. I mean, it's yeah. it's going to keep changing and it's it's amazing. I think AI and also, you know, automation and workflow management, which were already being developed. It's, it's going to change legal practice for the best because you're going to have efficiency. You're going to have competitive advantage with these different technologies. Mm -hmm. And attorneys are going to have more time for meaningful work. You know, that really That's complex, right. difficult work where you should be focusing on it. Instead, you're doing these kind of tasks that could be, don't need to be manual. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's it's funny because people will ask me uh, with some frequency, like, oh, and, and it's a little tongue in cheek, like, oh, mm -hmm. you work for a legal tech company. Like, are you trying to put yourself out of business? And it's like, actually quite the opposite. Like, right. Like, we're trying to eliminate the need for lawyers to who oftentimes are, you know, some of the more highly compensated folks at an organization, mm -hmm. spending time doing things that really are not delivering the same type of value um, as the activities for which they're primarily hired. And so it's really just optimizing for uh, for the lawyer's time, right? And you're really just saying, all right, what, what can I train a machine to do that basically anyone can do? Right. So that I can do only those things that, that only I can do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's, that's absolutely the best way to be looking at legal tech is how does it augment your people? How does it exactly. set people up for success, right? Right. It's like you think about, you think about, um, you know, uh, say Paylocity for mm -hmm. your, your your people function or uh, NetSuite or mm -hmm. something similar for for finance. Does that mean you don't need a CFO because you got, you bought NetSuite? Like, no, no, <laughs> definitely not, right? Um, so uh, you know, I think it's it's a natural evolution of things um, to have legal. The, particularly the in-house legal environment be disrupted by by meaningful tech advances, and I, and it's awesome to see you know leaders like you at the forefront of bringing AI into that. It's just incredible. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how how is it being a woman in tech? 
That was a really broad question, but. It is a broad yeah. question. It's very similar to being a woman in law because, you know, there, there are people that'll talk down to you or don't believe you have that knowledge that you have and just kind of a different treatment. But on the other side, there's some amazing people that want to mentor people and there's an amazing network, especially in legal tech and AI on LinkedIn. Wow, there's really supportive, both men and women, for people who are just interested in it, thinking about it or working in it. And what I tell people who are interested in the field and especially women, like find your network of people, find your people and find a mentor, really. Yeah. Just life-changing. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I know you touched on this a bit, just sort of in, in um, as you were telling, telling your background, your story, how, how you got here. Um, alternative careers with law degrees. For folks who are maybe looking at either changing the profession, because you, you said you were doing you were doing research for yeah. in the energy sector for mm -hmm. a little while. Yeah, um, many years. You know, how how tough was it for you to just make that leap and like really go and put yourself out there? And, and did you feel like you were starting from scratch? Um, and what would you tell people who are maybe thinking, all right, I need a career change. And it, maybe it's law firm to in-house, but um, particularly for people who are looking for alternative careers with legal backgrounds. Well, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, yes, I did feel <laughs> like I was totally starting over yeah. and, and interviewing for non-traditional legal jobs, you still find people are, why didn't you work in big law? Why weren't you on law review? You know, that's still, <sighs> those thoughts are still very miserable. strong. <laughs> <laughs> But as I said before, really um, connect with people on LinkedIn, create a network, find mentors, talk to people who work places you want to work. That's an amazing resource. And people, yeah. if they're happy with their job, they're happy to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> and it just, just read and write. Read content, comment on it, write your own articles. So for me, I just realized there was a gap that a lot of people who worked in legal tech or talked about it didn't fully understand what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I started just writing content, just kind of defining things, explaining things. And I ended up with this kind of large network and it's changed my life. I mean, yeah. people, people want to step out of traditional legal. I say go for it because you'll have a better work-life balance. Right. <laughs> and it's just so much opportunity, so many, I mean, there's legal ops, there's legal engineering, there's there's so many new ideas out there for law. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I got Alyssa over here waving at us. I think we've got some questions from the from the folks who are watching. Yes. Um, so the first one is, what's the most common misconception that people have about AI? I, I think what's tricky with AI, well, number one, people think the machines can think. They cannot, they cannot reason. They do not understand context. The machine only understands what you ask it to do, and it'll output what you ask it to do. You're right. going to need a human to interpret that. And with legal tech and AI, you, sh you should have someone with a legal background that understands that and can visualize it in a meaningful way. I, I think there's so many different misconceptions. I guess there's a lack of trust of AI. Okay. I've run into that with a lot of attorneys. They think it's going to replace them. It's not going to replace you. <laughs> Your AI cannot argue a case. It cannot reason and write. It might be able to assist with writing a brief or something like that. Yeah. But it, it's the magic of the attorney. It's the word art. It's none of that can be replicated by a machine. And you'll always need that. So yeah. I think that fear of all attorneys be, being robots is false. Right. Absolutely. I, I agree completely. I think, you know, as, as attorneys, as attorneys like start to think about that, it's like, well, hopefully there's a lot more complexity to your day in and day out career. Mm -hmm. That's, that is not going to be able to be replaced. I mean, even things as easy as like perception, right? Like under, right. like reading the person sitting across the table from you in mm -hmm. a deposition or, or in a boardroom or, um, or in a, or in a meeting, right. Where you're talking mm -hmm. about whatever it may be and, and trying to understand and craft a message that's going to connect. Right. Right. So 
tell people a lot of times, and this is something that, um, that Danielle Shear, one of our board members, mm-hmm. Danielle talks about um, with some frequency. She, uh, she talks about early on in her career, one of her mentors asked her uh, as she was struggling with, uh, struggling with an issue where she knew like from a legal perspective, she was right. Mm-hmm. She was having trouble um, being able to effectuate the change that she was trying to, trying to effectuate. And uh, her mentor said something that, that really resonated with me, definitely resonated with her. She's the one telling the story. But um, uh, her mentor asked her, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Mm. And I think that there's a meaningful difference there that machines probably are going to struggle to pick up. That right. most human beings, if given a little practice and a little bit of effort and attention to it, are are really really good at like quickly right right yeah so it's uh it's it's an interesting perspective for sure yeah Yeah. i always remind people i say legal ai it enhances legal practice but it doesn't replace it right exactly exactly Alyssa, what else do we have today um so what is one ai specific question that people should ask clm vendors that's a really good question so i think it's really important to make sure that that company is actually selling legal tech and AI because there's a lot of companies out there that sell automation tools or workflow um, management tools and they call them AI. So you you need to make sure that there's actual prediction happening and that they can converse about AI in a knowledgeable and meaningful way. Absolutely. And Alyssa, I think we have time for one more question. One more. This will be a fun one to end on. Um, What is your favorite aspect of your role as a legal engineer? That is difficult. I I really love collaborating with all the different departments. It's so much fun to work with people from so many different areas of expertise and then to kind of educate them and, and teach them about legal AI because even though we're that type of company, I think a lot of people don't understand how it really works and and to kind of see that light bulb go off and be like, wow, I mean, it's truly incredible what we develop here. And I I think it's, it's really fun to see, especially new people come in. And when we present to them, it's, it's just, it's a dream. Yeah. Uh, My my favorite is when, when people like, oh, your software should do A, B, C, D, and E. And you're like, that's, literally exactly what our software does. <laughs> so, uh, so we've just got a minute, a minute left here, a minute or two left here. Um, any closing thoughts, uh, any, any little bits of advice that you want to give to anybody listening on how they should be thinking about, um, how they should be thinking about incorporating tech into their, their, uh, their practice. Definitely don't be afraid. Uh, Don't expect it to do your job completely, but expect it to make you more efficient, make you give you a competitive edge against your competitors because you can work quicker and not spend time on kind of routine, meaningless tasks. And you'll have more time for the truly meaningful, complex legal work that's truly exciting and, and keeps everyone going back to the office each day. That's awesome. Eliana, thanks so much for joining thanks us. Thanks so much for awesome. having me. Like, tons of fun to get to know you a little bit better. And um, it's been awesome working with you, uh, you know, so far even before this. So thank you so much for taking time. I know you're really busy, so really appreciate it. Thank you. I've enjoyed visiting the office. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, for for listening today and tuning in. Um, if you like what you saw, please uh, like, subscribe, follow. Um, we, we put these out with some regularity, so looking forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.